chapter of my life. And uh, let me jump for we're going to read this little scripture here, as I do a little nugget every now and then. Um, Psalms 91, a familiar scripture that we know about. He said, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my God in him will I trust. He said, surely he shall deliver thee from the stair and from the fowl and from the nestlings of pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His shield should be thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor from the arrow that flyeth by day, nor from the pestilence that walketh not in darkness and whispers at noonday. Listen here, listen here, listen here. He said, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it not come nigh to thee. No matter what the devil planned, or what the devil tried to plot, it can do you no harm. Because we got some snakes, some centipedes, some alligators, some rats, some wipers. they among us. But it cannot do you no harm. You know why? Because you know where your dwelling place is. Amen? And you ought to know where your dwelling place is, which is in Jesus. Amen? Amen. We thank God again. Let us pray for God's blessing upon this house. Let us pray for God's blessing upon this country. Indeed, our prime minister, the opposition leader, that speak of the house, because the devil is out there. Bow your heads, lock your chin on your chest. If you ain't got no chest, lock it on your breast. Lock it on something, but let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you, God, for another day, God, to gather in this place. God, we ask you, God, to intervene upon us right now. God, we claim peace among us right now in the name of Jesus. Because we know we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. God, we ask your God to move like you never moved before. We decree blessings right now upon this government. God, and we decree miracles upon this country right now. And God, move like you never moved before right now. And we come against every sickness among us. Every COVID disease upon this country, we curse it right now in the name of Jesus. We lose your blessing, Lord. We thank you. We glorify you. For your name, God, is worthy to be praised. And children, thou hast taught us to say, Hallowed will be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Be done on earth and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who thrust us against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, your power and your glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God be with you that passes all understanding. Shai, when you finish. I just tell them that they see the school yesterday, so I turn around and I turn it back up there. Please. Mr. Paul spoke to you about the you wanted to leave some documents, right? Okay. Honorable, honorable members, the honorable member for Baines and Grandstown would like to lay some documents at this time, and I am now affording him that opportunity. Uh, the chair recognizes the member for honorable beans and grants now. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning, honorable members. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say good morning to my mom, uh, my sisters and brothers, and I'd also like to say good morning to the great people of the beans and grants now constituency. Uh, the good member for Fox Hill referred to me as the Republican. And I also would like to say um, this morning, Madam Speaker, <laughs> I, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of Barbados for what they did, and the and Mia Motley, the Prime Minister, uh, for what she did with respect to becoming a republic. And I just wanted to put it in the hearing, um, in this particular house, how how important that was for Barbados, and. In short order, we'll be 50 years old 
in short order. We'll be 50 years old. And I'm hoping that uh, one day we can, we can look at that and think about it. But my real purpose this morning, Madam Speaker, uh, when I rose in this house on Monday the 29th, I indicated that the, the majority of the spending as it relates to consumer spending was approximately 3%. And that 3% was related to bread basket items. And the good member for Central Grand Bahama, uh, he challenged that. So I wanted to lay this document on the table from the Bahamas, um, National Baham Bahamas National Statistical Institute so that he can have this information for his edification. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Honorable members, I, uh, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Central Grand Bahama. Speaker, um, I remember complimenting the good member for being in Grand Style on his report, and he said that I challenge um, the percentage. I didn't challenge it. Um, all due respect, I just asked him to provide information. So it was not a challenge. I didn't dispute what he said. I simply asked him to lay the document so that we also can study it and have the same information that he would have presented to this honorable house. Thank you, honorable member. Honorable member, when we suspended last evening, we were de debating a compendium of bills. I presume that we are now ready, as many. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Port Charlotte. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, I again, Madam Speaker, express, express my pride in your election as Speaker of this Honorable House. And similarly, Madam Speaker, I wish to express uh, my pleasure that I am being led by a very able colleague during this interregnum, um, and that is uh, the Member of Parliament uh, for Angliston, our Acting uh, Prime Minister. And it is a distinct pleasure for me because I was also led uh, by a very able um, colleague, and that is um, Cynthia Pratt, Mother Pratt, uh, when she served as acting prime minister. And I did not have the opportunity to serve with Dame Janet Bostwick, but I have always admired her from afar for her consistent advocacy for equality within our country. Madam Speaker, it is an interesting observation to make, and I cannot resist making it, that amongst the best of our population, and I'm talking about the women, we are still dealing with a human rights problem. And that is that our Constitution imposes a disability on our mothers, on our daughters, and our sisters. And having been led by such <coughs> extraordinary female Bahamian leaders, 
it is time that we commit ourselves to removing this disability and have the courage to remove the disparate treatment contained in the Constitution of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, because we all better when there is no barrier to the woman there, okay? <laughs> I also wish uh, to commend uh, my colleague, uh, the Member of Parliament for Marco City, on his election as the leader of the Free National Movement and uh, the leader of the official opposition. I've seen and been uh, friends with the Honorable Member for many years in different uh, roles and different contexts, and I certainly wish him well. Madam Speaker, I thank the people of Fort Charlotte for affording me the privilege of serving as their voice in this honorable house. As promised, we have started to roll out the commitments in Fort Charlotte. We promise to build sustainability within the community. And I am so pleased that last week we were able to contribute and hand over a greenhouse uh, to Eva Hilton uh, Primary School. And as the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, and marine resources always says, we have to make agriculture sexy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because if we grow organic food, not only are we more self-sufficient, but we also contribute uh, to wellness. Before Christmas, Madam Speaker, we shall also, and I want to thank with respect to the greenhouse, um, to Eva Hilton, thank, uh, Mrs. Diane Bo Pindling uh, for making that contribution. And before Christmas, we will also contribute another greenhouse to H.O. Nash Junior High School. And I want to thank my colleague, um, the Member of Parliament for Saudi Luthra and Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources for this contribution. Further, a working group of community members has been constituted to establish the Fort Charlotte Community Farm. This will be a social enterprise that will grow organic food within Fort Charlotte. And the funds generated from this um, social enterprise will be used to fund community outreach uh, programs. I am grateful for the vision volunteerism, and contribution of residents from throughout Fort Charlotte who are serving on this committee. Madam Speaker, as Minister of Works and Utilities, we are responsible for the public infrastructure of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. We also address the needs of client uh, ministries. And therefore, we are engaged on every island and every key of our archipelago. Because of this mandate, it has a very strong institutional and management structure of highly capable technical and administrative officers. We are at the service of our client ministries, whether it involves design, construction, or supervision of repair of building structures, such as the approximately 300 schools, 107 clinics, 100 police stations and buildings, 170 government residences, 26 airports, 600 post offices, the civil engineering structures comprising 40 bridges, 
160 docks, numerous culverts, retaining walls, and approximately 100 miles of sea walls. Many of the building structures within our Commonwealth were built in the 1970s or before. But with poor maintenance, <clears throat> inadequate quality control of materials and construction process, as documented in the assessment of the destruction of the built structures in Abaco and Grand Bahama after Hurricane Dorian. And Madam Speaker, it is important that every member of parliament read the assessment that was done after Hurricane Dorian and um, in Abaco as well as in Grand Bahama. And this report, which was uh, completed in November of 2019, is very instructive. And I just want to read, because if we continue to do the same old thing, Madam Speaker, we will face the wrath of global warming again and be as unprepared and as vulnerable as we were in 2019. And this report, which was um, comprised, uh, which was prepared by a special group of um, experts comprising the technical people from the Ministry of Works, as well as a number of architects and engineers from the private sector of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas who volunteered their time, as well as the University of Miami School of Architecture and Engineering. And this is what they said. The team's extensive examination and inspection of numerous buildings and structures throughout Central Abaco and East End of Grand Bahama reveal the extensive devastation did not appear to reflect on any shortcomings of the prescriptive structural requirements of the, of the building code, but was due to the glaring absence of code compliance. That is, many of the buildings that suffered moderate to severe damage or complete destruction was as a result of its basic non-compliance to the current code, whereas buildings that suffered minor damage appeared to have met the minimum building code standards in their design construction. And it makes a number of recommendations. It is sobering, Madam Speaker, and it ought to force us, especially the Ministry of Works and Utilities, to do some things differently. And that is why, in the course of my presentation, you will see that the Ministry is seeking to pivot by making some institutional changes, reviewing the building code. And much of this, some of this work has been done by the previous administration. So when we're not, I'm not here to criticize because the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is continuous. What the people have done is they have done on the 16th of September. Now they're saying to us, govern. And we are building on your work and the work of previous administration so that we, as we move forward, we need all hands on deck, Madam Speaker, because the hurricane is in PLP and it is in FNM. <laughs> in other words, we all have a vested interest in building resilience. Therefore, Madam Speaker, I begin by focusing on the effort and program of recovery. We are giving special focus to our hurricane damage islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama. 
On the 21st and 22nd of October, I visited Grand Bahama with the technical team of the ministry, had an excellent facilitation by the minister of Grand Bahama and um, the honorable member um, from West End and Bimini, and also uh, the honorable uh, member from East Grand Bahama, uh, who accompanied us to Water Key and to Sweeting Key and East Grand Bahama. And you cannot go into these communities and leave without a sense of urgency, whatever going on in Nassau and in other parts of this country. Priority has to be given to Grand Bahama. And as I listen to the local government representatives and, and, and the residents and so on, it is clear, and this is why we are focusing and I've, the cabinet has agreed for this supplemental funding of in excess of $5 million to complete the school in Homesis Rock, which is intended to also be a hurricane shelter. The Garnet Lavarity Judicial Complex is just about uh, completed. Um, the post office is nearing um, completion, which itself had been under water in uh, Freeport. Also, Madam Speaker, um, the post office the, in addition to the school in Eight Mile Rock, um, there are two complexes in Eight Mile Rock. You have the administrative complex and you have the magistrate's court uh, complex. Um, the, also in West End, the police station yes. crumbling. How do we expect people to maintain the security of the community if the bathroom if the ceiling, spalding concrete, and so on, and also the seawall in West End to protect the community from what seems to be almost an inevitability that there will be uh, future hurricanes. Madam Speaker, consistent with this mandate, I will travel to Moores Island tomorrow with the technical team and we have already uh, submitted to our cabinet um, a request for funding uh, for the Moores Island Airport uh, Terminal. Also, we appreciate that uh, there's uh, work uh, to be done with respect uh, to the school, that is the all-age school, and also the construction of a preschool unit. But we want to be on the ground and speak with the people, hear their concern, so that they help to shape the urgency and the priority of the work of the ministry here in Nassau. Next week, Madam Speaker, I will travel along with technical colleagues uh, to Abaco, to mainland Abaco next Wednesday, we will be there also on Thursday and also on Friday. And we will meet with stakeholders in Abaco. We will also look at the restoration work uh, being done on the ground. And I will detail some of them, the road, the road work on the Ernest Dean Highway, the, the Stink Pond Causeway, uh, schools and other infrastructure that um, is in need of urgent attention. Madam Speaker, pursuant to this report that I mentioned, the ministry performs a vital function in terms of regulating the construction industry. And this is done largely uh, through the building control section of the ministry, whose task is to oversee and superintend the construction of all new facilities in the Bahamas. While performing this function, 
We have been made painfully aware that the standard and design of new structures must perform to a rigid code um, prescription. The lessons of, hurricane, of recent hurricanes, such as what was experienced by Rugged Island, Abaco, and Grand Bahama, have taught us not to let our guard down in this vital area of our powers and functions. For this reason, this reason, Madam Speaker, we are presently engaged in a review and updating of the building code, even though it is regarded within our region as one of the most robust. But Madam Speaker, Dorian taught us a lesson. We're not robust enough, especially in the enforcement. So the building code is being reviewed as well as other aspects of the building control section to ensure that we are current and up to date on what is now required to ensure resilience and sustainability in the face of climate change. When this review of the building code and a more effective inspectorate regime, including third party inspection, is completed, we hope to be able to embrace new technology and to make new standards of enforcement, compliance, and procedures a part of the building practice in the Bahamas. Allied, Madam Speaker, to the work of the ministry in this vital area is the Department of Physical Planning. Let me say that this Department of Physical Planning does not merely exist to rubber stamp planning applications. Through the new, and next Monday, we will appoint the new Town Planning Committee. The role of this unit is vital to the proper physical planning, urban planning, questions of density and physical location of buildings in the face of flooding due to sea level rises, coastal erosion, and other factors. In short, Madam Speaker, the work of this department has been heightened due to our recent experiences. Moving from these general observations, I now turn to the 2021-2022 uh, supplemental budget. As we have heard from previous speakers, most particularly the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the supplemental budget was necessary in light of the fiscal challenges that the country faces but while being more than conscious that it is very necessary to maintain a level of expenditure that would bring about restoration of the economy, and while at the same time addressing essential services and necessary infrastructural needs. And this is the challenge, Madam Speaker, in a country that is a big country. It has a small population, but it is a big country. 100,000 square miles of sea. This is the only country I know in the Caribbean, in, the, in this region other than the United States and Canada, and possibly Brazil, that has 28 airports, 15 of which must be FAA compliant because they're international airports, flights coming in from Europe, from South America, from North America. This is the only country. 28 airports, 15 international airports. Each international airport must have its own firefighting um, infrastructure and machines and vehicles and so on. So it is an extraordinary infrastructural challenge in a country without income tax. Without income tax. Without a progressive system of taxation. 
the poor pays the same as the rich. And for most of the people, the bulk of one's earnings go into food and rent and things like that. So we have, it, it requires extraordinary skill, but increasingly the government is forced to borrow. And thus we have in 2019 a GDP of 12.8 billion dollars. And today, Madam Speaker, a national debt of over $10 billion, which is almost equal to the G GDP. So clearly, Madam Speaker, it's unsustainable. We have to begin to do some things differently and build some sustainability and some resilience. There are some hard choices that all of us have to make. And I've approached the Ministry of Works and Utilities with that understanding that as we, as we recover, as we rebuild, and as we revolutionize, how can we build more efficiency, more innovation, <clears throat> creativity, with decreasing money? <laughs> Madam Speaker, with decreasing revenue, not more revenue, the needs are growing but the revenue is decreasing and therefore there needs to be all hands on deck. My ministry will tighten its belt and operate within the confines of the recurrent budget using strategic planning and operational methodologies so that there is not a drop in the level of service to the people of the Commonwealth. Among the ongoing projects that will need to be funded through this supplementary uh, budget, Madam Speaker, we have the airport infrastructure program, and this is supported by the IDB. And I had a meeting yesterday with the country representative, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Correa. And, and, and it was very instructive because we have to do some things differently. This loan, for the airport, $35 million approved in 2017. Um, and this 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21. And of this three, $35 million, Madam Speaker, only 3% of it has been dispersed. 3%, that's this, 3% have been dispersed to date. But yet, the expiration is about a year and a half out. So clearly, we can't be doing the same thing. We have to begin to do some things differently. We see that this loan, um, and I've invited um, the country representative of the IDB to accompany me on uh, next week. Um, so that as we travel, she can be with us, she can hear the urgency of our people and see the critical needs of the infrastructure rather than um, hear it secondhand. And she's indicated she's been to Abaco shortly after the hurricane, but now she's going with us because we are partners in this process. So I extended that invitation. We also have um, under contract um, the Rugged Island Community uh, Center and School, the Andre Rogers Baseball Stadium, the Crash Fire and Rescue Building at Blinden Pindling International Airport, and the Government House renovations. And again, I've met with the contractor at Government House, um, seen the additional work that needed to be done and we have a very strict um, belt. We have an estimated completion time. And I'm very grateful to the contractor and to the team, Mr. Pickstock, supervising that contract, that we're moving it as quickly as possible. And on my side, I'm trying to get them paid, the contractor paid as 
regularly as uh, possible. But the, the cabinet has approved the additional funding. Other projects which we will drive to completion in this supplemental budget include urgent repairs to uh, the Thomas Rob Robinson uh, Stadium, installation of roads and infrastructure in the Golden Athlete Subdivision, repairs to the Moors Island Terminal, uh, <clears throat> repair to settlement roads in Governor's Harbor, Eleuthera, and in the instance of Moors Island Airport, I've already stated that. Madam Speaker, the repair of infrastructure damage by um, Hurricane Dorian is well underway. I want to speak also uh, to uh, BPL. I'm pleased that the board uh, was um, installed last week, and I thank the outgoing board. And BPL, Madam Speaker, has been given a very clear directive to increase power generation from renewable sources by 30% in 2030. I'm also pleased that um, BPL has uh, engaged in a national program uh, to build microgrids uh, in our family islands, modernization of the metering uh, for electricity transmission uh, throughout our country, and to stabilize the delivery of power in places like Eleuthera, we are also working to harmonize the work of BPL with the work of the Water and Sewerage Corporation so that there could be um, a better delivery of service, both of electricity and uh, water. We also, Madam uh, Speaker, will be giving an accounting of uh, the Straw Market Authority, as well as Water and Sewage, and my distinguished colleague uh, from South Beach and the Parliamentary Secretary uh, in the Ministry of Works will update this Honourable House in this debate on those uh, two authorities. Madam Speaker, I end by saying that in addition to working more efficiently we have to be prepared to revolutionize. And I've given in these three sentences, the ministry, the commitment to identify new sources of funding. And I'm talking about grant funding, not loans. We also have to foster a culture Honorable of member. systematic maintenance. Honorable member, do you need an additional two minutes? Yes, just, just one. An yes. additional one minute. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable okay. Member. Madam Speaker, we, we, we need to foster a culture of systematic maintenance of our public infrastructure. The absence of systematic maintenance means that when we address the infrastructure, it is so corroded, so um, deteriorated that we end up having to build a new building or a new structure and therefore wasting public uh, money, which could have been avoided had we had the systematic uh, maintenance. We also, and I challenge the ministry ourselves, that we must seize this opportunity, Madam Speaker, to become a global model of small island nation state sustainability and resilience through the design, construction, maintenance of the public infrastructure. We have the creativity, we have the imagination. We must incentivize our people, not only to imitate, but to innovate. And with that, Madam Speaker, I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many.
chair recognizes the honorable member for Fox Hill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to recognize yesterday was World AIDS Day. I wasn't here uh, to be able to make the official statement uh, from the foreign ministry. But I noticed when I was watching the television last evening that most people had worn the red ribbon. So I was uh, grateful for that. And uh, I say that because in the midst of this present pandemic, uh, most people forget what happened in the 1980s. And so many of my friends and colleagues uh, died uh, of this disease as a result of prejudice largely, with the Western world ignoring the matter, thinking that it only affected a certain group of people, and then it spread to the wider population, and people died uh, unnecessarily. And so um, I think it is uh, good that uh, Kevin Delancey and his yes. folk up in uh, Eight Mile Rock are still uh, there. Um, marking the day and remembering those who passed away. And I want to thank him for the work which he did and thank uh, the member of parliament for Nassau Village who went and stood in for me at the World AIDS Day service in Grand Bahama yesterday. Uh, secondly, uh, Madam Speaker, I want to extend congratulations of uh, the member of parliament for Bain and Grantstown already extended congratulations to the people of Barbados and the prime minister was there uh, on the transition of their country from, uh, from a uh, parliamentary um, uh, system, uh, uh, a monarchy, sorry, to uh, a republic. And uh, it was quite an interesting thing to watch. Uh, Bahamian people seem to have been enlivened by it. Everybody seemed to be watching, you know, uh, Mia Motley, their prime minister, is the flavor of the month. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, um, I hope that the Bahamian people would be pleased to know that the prime minister extended a formal invitation on behalf of the cabinet for her to pay a state visit here uh, in the springtime of next year. Uh, it's important, Madam Speaker, to do these. We tried um, in the past, uh, we did, uh, to make sure that we did at least one state visit uh, during our term. Uh, the first one was uh, Tadal and Becky uh, from South Africa. Uh, the second one was General Granger, who is the president of Guyana. And uh, so this will be the third. And <clears throat> it's because, uh, not because we think that, uh, you know, it's all fun and games. It's, it's part of statecraft. Uh, what, what that did for Barbados was it helped to solidify Barbados as a country and gave people a sense of self, a sense of pride in their country. Similarly, we saw it when we opened the session of parliament here. The ceremony, the statecraft, which is associated with it, gives people, they, it, they all give people a sense that this is a commonwealth of the Bahamas and that we belong to it. And it's one of the reasons why we want to change the system so that we have sessions every year of the parliament to have that kind of grounding every year. Uh, people get a sense that this is their country, what the country means. Uh, the police and the military get a chance when the state visit takes place to practice their craft, uh, to uh, do the drills which they would not normally do, and get a sense of how the Bahamas fits into the larger uh, part of the world. So we hope that that is, a, that is a visit which is welcomed. As for the official policy on the Republic, you know that the uh, commission which studied the Constitution the last time merely passed over it, saying that this was a matter which they were sure that at some point in the future the Bahamian people were going to have to uh, think about. And people have asked, what is a republic? Uh, it is simply uh, power comes from the people up in a monarchy, power devolves from the monarchy down. So it is uh, psychological, it is cultural, but it is important because what it does is the head of state becomes a Bahamian. And the Bahamian is elected or appointed as a head of state. And that says we have severed all of the colonial ties and that we are self-reliant. We know who we are and we are a Bahamian nation fully. And I'm hoping one day, uh, I was really hot when the member of Grantstown sent me a note after the uh, a voice note a couple of days ago saying, I'll take up the battle because I said, I thought it was all lost. I didn't know the younger generation had any interest in this at all. Uh, but, you know, I've been fighting this issue for 40 years and uh, hope that that's, that's where we get uh, one day. So I want to start out uh, with that, secondly. Uh, thirdly, uh, Madam Speaker, I was a bit amused, uh, and I understand now, with congratulations to my honorable opponent uh, from Marco City uh, on becoming the leader of the opposition. Uh, I told them as we started, it's a long way from Mason's edition and the park when we were all out there together. So uh, 
I hope you do well in the job, and I hope you remain leader of the opposition for many, many years. Uh, and, uh, and I will help you. I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a joke. laughs> but I understand now why in his other life he was a, a writer and he used to take the mickey out of politicians because I was reading um, this story in the press, um, Wazway, about poverty and the poor and how there was great passion about why we, we the PLP, are uh, not looking out for the poor because we're changing the rules on VAT and all the rest of this. And I said, where did all this passion come from for the poor? Because poverty increased over the last four and a half years. And the poor, the poor were so grateful that on the 16th of September, they rewarded uh, the, the passion maker uh, for his passion for the poor. So I just a bit amused by it. And I was grateful that civil society answered. It wasn't us who answered. They said, look, you didn't read the reports. You didn't understand the advice you were being given. Read the reports and, uh, and understand the advice you're given. And then you'll know why we are where we are and what we have to do. Uh, so anyway. I'll leave that there. Since everybody was in a statesmanlike mode this morning, <laughs> I better behave. Um, the public service is part of my uh, remit. And I want to say that the last time I was public service minister, I had a very modest uh, desire. I promised the Bahamian public that before I left as minister for the public service, I would be sure I would try to accomplish this particular reform that every office of the government that you called, they would answer the telephone by the second ring. Um, I failed. Very, very modest, but I failed. And I've come back to office and nothing has changed. Still the same. And I keep, I said to the last prime minister, and, and I'm using the, the telephone example as the, the, we, we, we have to become, the public service has to become a more effective executing instrument for government. Michael Manley told me something in an interview back in 1980. He said that part of the reason why the reforms in Jamaica that they were trying to carry out failed was because the public administration sagged under the weight of all of the stuff they were passing. So politicians were busy passing this, passing that, but ended up not being able to execute. And unless you execute, you could sit and pass any law you like. Uh, the former attorney general and I crossed the floor. I said to him, you're passing a law. Just heard the honorable minister say, how the Water and Sewage Corporation and BPL are going to cooperate moving together. And I remember Loftus Roker, when he was the Minister of Works, sitting me down in his office at 7 o'clock, and I was saying the same thing. You know, he was the Minister of Works, and he had Water and Sewage Corporation, BTC, and BPL working together. And they said, no, we're going to, with the Ministry of Works, and we're going to make sure that when the roads are dug up, it's all done, we let everybody know in advance so we don't have to dig up the road again. And what are we doing now? Same thing. You're passed a law saying that if you dig up the road without permission, you get a fine of $10,000. I said, well, that ain't going to stop them from digging up the road. And almost, I, the words weren't out of my mouth a month before the road was dug up again that they just paved. So I'm not sure what we do, but our job now that we're at the helm is to try and fix the public administration. That's the main job. How do we get this done? To, so that people can stop complaining about, I retire at the age of 65. You send me a letter a year before I retire. Tell me, you know, carry my behind because you're going. And then when I apply for my pension, I can't get it a year yes. later. Yeah. One year later, you can't get your pension. Why is that? National insurance takes you nine months to process an application for a pension. I mean, so, something has got to be wrong with all of, all of this. And so our job is to try and fix all of these things. I was happy to talk to one of the members of one of the service commissions, talk about reform of these service commissions. The, the files piled up high, 
You can't seem to get people's promotions, transfers. None of this stuff seems to be processed on time. And there are always errors of one kind or another. How do we fix this? So that's, that's our job going forward. Now, I got a call yesterday uh, as a result of a comment that I made about the performance of BTC while we were in Barbados. So I land in Barbados. And as soon as I land in Barbados, the phone stops working. It says that the SIM card does not connect or does not allow me to connect with the telephone company in Barbados, which I know is foolishness because I've been there before and the phone connects, connected before. Same thing happened to one of the prime minister's aides. So, of course, the recourse is to press a button. BTC is supposed to connect and they come on. Lo lovely lady comes on and says, you reach BTC, blah, 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 blah. Press this, press that, uh, and we'll fix it. Six times got no one on the line, six times. So, of course, I was fit to be tied because these days with these phones, if, you, if they're not working, you're dead in the water, you know, dead in the water. So, uh, anyway, I fired off this note. These notes are actually meant for PLPs, but, you know, they end up where they are. Uh, and so I get this call from the head, the CEO of the company, and I'm grateful that he took the particular interest to call. My point is, though, it's not the particular problem that I'm interested in. It's the general problem which we face. And I spoke about this before in connection with the banks and the services which they offer to people, uh, only to have one of the regulators of the bank tell me to go fly a kite. Don't come complaining to me because the services are bad. It's your own fault. That's the problem. I, I brought that to the attention of the central bank governor. This is not what a regulator is supposed to be saying because there are problems with services being offered by the banks. And it's contracting and it's getting worse. Uh, there, there is no, no one seems to be paying attention to consumer complaints. It just gets worse, worse, worse as the days go by. The same thing with the so-called digital platforms. The central bank governor, uh, I want to congratulate him because Bloomberg just uh, praised him as one of the 50 kind of change agents around the world in banking by <coughs> the invention of the sand dollar. Uh, this was just published yesterday. So congrats, congratulations to, to uh, Governor Rowe. But the, the point I was making to him is that we cannot do the things we want to do in terms of commerce, in terms of government, unless we fix the digital platform. So you can promise all the things you want unless the digital platform is fixed. And it is clear that both telephone companies have no interest in investing in the digital platform. So that is why in our last platform, we made this commitment of an investment in fiber optics across the country because it seems that we're gonna, the government is going to have to take on that role again. And I, I saw where uh, they said that the country is not ready for 5G. The surgeons will tell you, Madam Speaker, that 5G is necessary if you're going to have real telemedicine. In other words, if people are going to be able to operate, the lag time for 4G is simply too long. 5G is what you need because the lag time is sufficient. You can actually operate overseas. And this may become necessary in the age of pandemic and the, all the travel restrictions and all the rest of it. But there needs to be an investment in this digital platform. But at the same time, while we're trying to get there, I'm saying to both these phone companies, you know, stop selling cell phones, marketing cell phones, while the services are getting worse, yes. you know, calls dropping. Yesterday, I'm speaking to someone on the uh, WhatsApp. The call dropped seven times, mm. seven times. Uh, the phone call, yeah, dropped seven times, the voiceover IP, seven times. This should not be. And, we, and we're advertising our country as a modern first world country and all these services which we're going to offer. It's just not, not, not going to happen unless we do that. So I urge them. I urge them to take a second look at where they're going with this. And I hope that IRCA, as it's really uh, newly constituted, will uh, look at this and urge them to be more consumer oriented in what they do. Both the banks, talking to the banks, and to those who are engaged in the telecommunications and data business uh, in this country. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the appointment of diplomats. 
so that uh, process, as you know, is one which is reserved largely to the Prime Minister. Uh, Article 112 of the Constitution gives the Prime Minister the authority to say who serves overseas. And that process, the process is undergoing. Unfortunately, uh, there are lots of names now flo floating around with this and that and all the rest of it, but none of it has been officially announced because in the way these things go, countries have to agree to who serves. And we don't want to get into a situation where we got in before where you announce something, then the country says, sorry, the person is not acceptable. So it'll take a while as it goes through, but confidentiality is important. Uh, but be assured that the work is being done. And be assured also that we intend to carry out uh, our role to expand um, the services which we offer overseas as Bahamians are more diverse across the world. And this may include uh, high commission in Jamaica and Trinidad, uh, consulates in Los Angeles, Toronto, Halifax, Chicago, and Houston. And uh, the, the, the Foreign Service will also be recruiting uh, new people. Some have already uh, been taken on, uh, and they'll be training. Now, what I want to say to folk is that the Foreign Service is not an elite corps. I know people think it's sort of this high highfalutin thing. But my view about the Foreign Service is that it must include people from every cohort and every socioeconomic group. So the high school graduate to the university graduate to the PhD and, and in between have to all have, because I got this from Grafton Eiffel, he was assistant commissioner of police once, and he told me that the police force every year has to get some from, the, from every cohort because the good guys in the cohort understand the criminals in the cohort. And so if the police want to, police force want to be relevant, they have to make sure that they get some from every year. And that's my view about the Foreign Service. Every year we need to recruit 10, 20 people so that we get from the crop coming out of school. And we made a mistake uh, imposing a moratorium prior to 2002. There was no hiring for almost 10 years in the Foreign Service. So what happens now is you've got up at the top, down at the bottom, and in the middle, no one in between. So we're trying to rectify that problem. But I also don't want to give the impression that the Foreign Service is a dumping ground for everybody who wants to flee the Bahamas. It's not that. This is something to, to do a job, a specific job, for and on behalf of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And when your time is up, come back home. That's... That's uh, what I believe. Um, so I want to thank those people who are, in fact, Foreign Service officers for all the work which they do for and on behalf of the country. And I mean, they do extraordinary work, extraordinary. And I think underpaid for the jobs which they uh, do. I think that going forward, we started the process of separating the Foreign Service from the public service, and that we hope to finish the job uh, during this term uh, because of the special uh, situations which Foreign Service, uh, Foreign Service officers find themselves. You want to make sure that you have a proper Foreign Service with its own rules. For example, one of the, one of the things we found a bit strange was in all foreign services is that if you want to get married, you got to write the permanent secretary and get permission to get married. So I want you to know, if you join, join in the foreign service, that that's one of the, one of the rules. Um, it's there in black and white. Yeah, right. Uh, you couldn't live in sin, though. Um, so um, the other... The things that we plan to do, of course, we've been asked before, is the foreign affairs building and the parliamentary complex and the support for members of parliament. And, you know, this has been a whipping horse of mine, this support of members of parliament. I think that members of parliament ought to have support for, uh, you know, you have these uh, obligations, these mandates which you have, one of which is the public disclosure. And, you know, you go scrambling around at the end of the year, people trying to fix up their public disclosure, I think that you ought to have an accountant that is paid for by the House of Assembly that supports that work for you. So you don't have no any issue in trying to get these things done uh, and finished. Um, 
there needs, of course, to be a proper building. This building was built in 1815 or thereabouts. Uh, we've been using it as a House of Assembly, and this was emblematic of the wealth and power of the day when the loyalists overtook the governing of the country. Uh, it does not represent what we are today, and we need to make a stab at putting our own imprint uh, on, on our country uh, with this. And that is why I thought that uh, the discussion uh, which we had on on the Bahamas and you know whether it should be uh, a republic or not uh, was interesting. And I wish to commend to all colleagues a letter which was written by Ralph Gonzalez, who is the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And it was written uh, to Mia Motley as the Prime Minister of Barbados. Uh, and it's, it's interesting from this point, point of view. It gives you a history of what, uh, what the progress is toward independence of all of our countries. Uh, it was interesting to me that uh, traveling with me in Barbados was the uh, High Commissioner to Barbados designate, who is the Member of Parliament for Seabreeze and uh, the Ambassador designate to Caracol, and uh, the aides of, to, to the Prime Minister and uh, to myself. And none of those persons were born in 1973 when the Bahamas became an independent nation. And what they saw for the first time was a reprise of what happened in the Bahamas in 1973. Because there you had Prince Charles, who presented the constitutional instruments to the Bahamas in 1973, at the ceremony in Barbados, officially saying farewell as a representative of his mother, who is, of course, was then the head of state. There is a picture was, which was taken, which says exactly what this means. And the picture has Dame, the, the former governor general, now president of Barbados, standing on a podium, giving an award, the Order of Freedom, to Prince Charles. And she is standing on the upper platform and Prince Charles is standing on the bottom platform and she's handing him the award. That said everything in that picture about what it meant, that that transition had taken place. Yes. Uh, and so uh, what, what, what I thought was that they got to experience the history of that taking place. And you would know, uh, Madam Speaker, with all of my uh, relationships uh, as a public figure. My view is the Commonwealth of the Bahamas cannot succeed unless younger people buy into the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, mm -hmm. that this is a place to stay, that it is a good place for them to raise their families, and this is a place where they can put down their roots. So my job, life's work, if you want to make it, is to be sure and, and I think it needs to be a wide net, uh, not based on prejudice. I, it doesn't concern me about, you know, your color and all the rest of this stuff or your class. Everybody should come because the country belongs to you. And you must make of it when you get the opportunity. I say this to all of them. When you are on the stage, Shakespeare says, all the world's a stage. And we have our exits and our entrances. And in our lives, we play many parts. But when we're on the stage, we're supposed to do what we can do and not step back from what we can do. And we got short time, all of us, to be here. Some of us will only last a term. Uh, but forever, however long we are here, we're supposed to do what we can do to move the project of democracy, of economic empowerment forward. Uh, so Lyndon Pindling left that mission to us the question of economic empowerment. Yes, and we intend to move with dispatch with this. Yes, you know, we cannot leave the country in a situation where only elites have the money and it doesn't spread around. And, and that's why we were so concerned about all this procurement legislation that they left in place, which appeared to be, you know, a lot of fancy words and stuff. But basically it was gonna end up those people who had the money would still have the money at the end of the day. And I don't want that. What I want is affirmative action. I want yeah, that kid yeah. who grows up yeah. in, 
my bank account to know I could get a contract too. That's what I want him to know. I don't do stuff. Yeah, legally get a contract. And I talking about graft or any of that thing. Legally get a contract and make himself some money. And so he says at the end of the day when he goes home or her, this is my country. That's right. This is my country. And I have a future here. I can raise my kids here. That's our job. And that's what this 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 uh this supplementary bill, all of this, this 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 government, that's that's what we're gonna be doing. We're not looking left or right, blind is on. Yes, but I also want to say to those who get the opportunity that it's a rare opportunity and treat it as such. Do good, you know, keep keep on the straight now and also, do not be boastful. Now, I'm saying this advisedly now because younger people, and I guess older people too, I shouldn't put it on them. You know, <laughs> you get an opportunity. The first thing you do is you go run it out and say, boy, guess, guess what I get, you know? And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and who moved this and moved the next thing. You know, you, you got to avoid that stuff, you know? Charity, what they say, vaunteth not itself in the old language, right? It's not boastful. You know, so you keep your counsel. If you keep your counsel, that is the safest. That means mind your own business, keep your mouth shut. That's what it means. And do what you have to do. Uh, do not go around making enemies with people unnecessarily. It, it just it just isn't helpful. So that that's basically the the message which I I would like to leave generally. Uh, the IDB did a report which uh, when I was public service minister, which I shared with the prime minister yesterday. And they said that one of the issues with regard to public sector reform, they, they listed seven things. But the one that struck me is too many things get kicked up to the cabinet that don't need to do so. And the result is that the cabinet is engaged in minutia. You know, well, somebody's going to fly down to address on five and get a $500 ticket or not. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, you have a $2 billion corporation and you've got 20 people sitting around deciding whether they can spend $5 for someone to go buy a, a sandwich or something. This is ridiculous. Tony Blair, when he was the prime minister, did an interview once and he said, uh, I can't figure out. He says, my cabinet meetings are 45 minutes. He says, I can't figure out what I'd be talking to my ministers about after 45 minutes. Well, we may not be able to go there. But the fact is that the whole, all these processes can be more efficiently done. And we now have this fancy thing called e-cabinet. I mean, Lord have mercy. I mean, all I can say about that is it's fancy. Does it actually change the, 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 the way things move? You know, it, I, I left government four and a half years ago, and the government moves the same way. Nothing has changed. And that's why I've been here since 2002, been in the parliament since 92. And I just keep seeing the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. So uh, the younger ones, again, you all got to push us to get this changed because the next group should not have to meet, you know, should not have to meet this, should not have to meet this. And I'm counting on you all, right? Do not be quiet. <laughs> Do not be quiet. Do not sit on your mouth. You know, I know we have a parliamentary caucus and, you know, there are rules about how all of that applies. But we must be vigorous because we want to win the next election and the election after that. Yes, yes. Now, uh, to help my friends, my friends, <laughs> I'm trying to help you <laughs> maintain your job. <laughs> for as long as you will have it. <laughs> uh, but that's my word uh, to you. I'm grateful for the time. I'm, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity, a rare opportunity to serve in this parliament. I hope I, I can see from the pride on everybody who's here that they also appreciate the opportunity that you've gotten. And I hope that at the end of this particular epoch, we will be able to say we've done well done for our country. And God bless you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The Chair recognizes the Honourable Member for Thank Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I had uh, promised to lay on the table um, a report entitled 
reconnaissance report on the built environment in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian for the Ministry of Public Works, compiled by Mr. Craig G. Delancey, uh, Buildings Control Officer, dated November 2019. Thank you. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document to lie on the table. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for South Beach. Thank you and good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning, good morning Honorable Members. Madam Speaker, firstly, allow me to join in with the host of well wishes in bringing congratulatory remarks to the Honorable Member for Marco City on his preferment. Congratulations, my brother. I believe that you will do well. Madam Speaker, before I begin my contribution, I would like to offer condolences to a few, a few families in the Southeast constituency who would have lost their loved ones over the course of the last few weeks. So I offer condolences to the families of Michael Brennan and Cecilia Miller. Likewise, condolences to Rebecca Smalls and her family who live on the corner of Palm Avenue and South Beach Drive on the loss of both parents, mother and father. We know that this is a difficult time for you, and we want to assure you that our prayers and thoughts are with you as you endure this time of bereavement. Madam Speaker, once again, I am humbled as I stand within the hollow halls of this very special place to represent the great and hard working people of South Beach. I therefore take this opportunity seriously and soberly and with the help of my creator, commit again to doing my very best for the people of South Beach and Bahamians in general. Our South Beach office has been operational since September 27th with daily office hours from 9 to 5 p.m. And effectively on October 11th, we commenced in earnest our meetings with our constituents. The South Beach Constituency Office facilitates meetings with constituents every Tuesday and Thursday between the hours of 4 and 9 p.m. No appointments necessary, Madam Speaker. No appointments necessary. I have heard the rumblings of this from some of my colleagues. Barkas, you will burn yourself out. Those hours are far too much. But I am reminded, however, that the people of South Beach were the, those who delivered me the, a convincing victory at the polls. And therefore, I ought to do, make myself available as best I can. South Beach, Madam Speaker, like many other constituencies, has its fair shares of challenges many of which resonate within our economy. As our economy continues to rebound and our blueprint for change implemented, I see brighter and better days with regard to employment for the people of South Beach and indeed the Bahamas. We've just come through the past few weeks, a period of time where it seems as though it rained almost every day, Madam Speaker. This of course presents two major challenges for the constituency of South Beach. The first being a large volume of mosquitoes within the neighborhoods. And with thanks to the Ministry of the Environmental Health, we were able to manage this situation admirably. I wish especially to give a special thanks to Mr. Shanti Richards at the Ministry of Environmental Health, who led a team of inspectors, who led the charge to ensure that all environmental needs and matters brought to our attention by our residents were dealt with prompt and efficient manner. The Ministry of Environment has assured us that they will be spraying on a monthly basis, and so we will indeed hold their feet to the fire. 
I listened yesterday to my MP, the Honorable Member Golden Isles, Minister of Environment, repeat his telephone number at the ministry on a few occasions, 302-5293 or 4, during his contribution yesterday. I want to, to advise him, he was here earlier, he stepped out, that I, along with the administrative assistant at, at the South Beach constituency office, have made note of him, and we plan to use him. Secondly, South Beach is plagued with the problem of flooding. The rains during the month of October and November provided us with a great opportunity to assess the drainage system in South Beach. And of course, to allow for some determinations to be made. <clears throat> the Ministry of Works conducted assessments of the drains and found that many of the drains in South Beach have been simply neglected and only need be cleared. We've also found that some are aged and need a replacement. I expect that the work towards ratifying these, ratifying these issues will commence as early as January 2022, as this has been a lingering problem for many years within the constituency, I have committed to getting these matters resolved. <laughs> Madam Speaker, over the past, or within the past two weeks, we recognize in this country a season called harvest, which usually coincides with the American holiday of Thanksgiving. During this past harvest time, I had the opportunity to say thank you to a group of persons who we often in our daily routine forget. And that, Madam Speaker, is the elderly. Our constituency had an opportunity to say thank you in a very tangible way to the residents of the nurse Naomi Christie Center for old or older persons. This center is located in Jasmine Gardens within the constituency of South Beach. As many of you may be aware, the home is named in honor of the late mother of our former Prime Minister, the, Honor the Honorable Perry Gladstone Christie. I invited the former Prime Minister to join me on this occasion, and he, he happily ac accepted. And together, we have committed to ensuring that the home can access resources beyond the normal scope. I thank the former Prime Minister for his commitment to this effort, and I look forward to working with him in this regard. Our next quarterly constituency meeting will be held, oh sorry, our first quarterly constituency meeting was held November 16, and the residents attended in goodly numbers. They expressed their concerns and shared their vision for a better South Beach. Madam Speaker, I must report that we are well on the way in South Beach. The Minister of Youth and Sport, the Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture and I have had discussions about South Beach pools and the important role that it has played in the lives of the residents in the past and how best we can reinvigorate this back into the community through our social media, our constituency office hours, our constituency meetings, events, and activities. We plan to keep the residents of South Beach engaged as we have adopted the theme, we are better together. Madam Speaker, I am also indeed eternally grateful to the Honorable Prime Minister for the faith bestowed in me with the appointment as the Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry of Public Works and Utilities. And I say thank you to the Minister, the Permanent Secretary, the Director, the Deputy Directors, and the extremely hardworking staff at, at this ministry for their continuous support daily. This ministry has been charged with the responsibility for the construction, maintenance, and upkeep of the public infrastructure including roads, docks, bridges, and cemeteries, cemeteries. 
the Minister of Public Works and Utilities has already addressed for us and given us the current position as it relates to various capital projects. I, however, would like to highlight one area of which I am extremely proud of our ministry. You would have heard him say, and, I, and note, that the repairs of the infrastructure damaged by Hurricane Dorian to Abaco and Grand Bahama Islands are ongoing. This is of utmost importance to me because not only does it speak to the resiliency and determination of Bahamian people, but it speaks volumes to the resiliency, stick to and selflessness of the Ministry of Work employees on those islands. Yes. These employees, never mind the, that, they are, that they are salvaging the pieces of their individual lives and their personal situations, they return to work to build and they put country above self yes, yes. and they build with resilience. Yes. And for that, for that alone, they deserve recognition and applause. This supplementary budget, Madam Speaker, gives this ministry the opportunity to exercise with financial prudence and economic wisdom as we operate within the confines of the budget to utilize proper strategic planning and ingenious methods of operation to ensure that our Bahamian people receive the level of service that they are accustomed to. We are reminded daily by our minister that our goal is to ensure that this country become the model of small island developing states and the Ministry of Public Works must be the driving force behind this development. Madam Speaker, when last I stood in this house on November 1st and had the opportunity to address the Bahamian people, I remind them or reminded them of the dignity of sim in simplicity. I reminded our members and the Bahamian public that the various straw and craft markets throughout the Bahamas have existed for many years and have been the source of financial assistance for many families. These straw business entrepreneurs have, over many years, purchased properties, constructed homes, educated their children, and have made a first-class living for themselves at these various markets. When last I stood here, we lamented on the fact that these markets had been closed for nearly 22 months. And I mentioned that we look forward to announcing soon a date for reopening. Madam Speaker, today, I can announce to you and the Bahamian public that four of the five New Providence straw markets are open for business. Our beloved straw business entrepreneurs were elated, ecstatic, and overjoyed to return to work. To go back to work with a sense of pride, Madam Speaker. To go back to work with a sense of purpose. To go back to work with their dignity and time. Yes. Madam Speaker, I must thank the Honorable Prime Minister and the Honorable Minister of Health for paying a pop-up courtesy call at the straw market. Unannounced to myself or the Minister for Public Works, they visited the market soon after it was open. Madam Speaker, the calls that I received that evening were so heartwarming, so genuine, and indeed emotional. One straw business entrepreneur called and I must admit, I saw her phone, I saw her number calling me, and I said, Lord, she calling me again? But she said to me, Mr. Roll, uh, you know I, I ain't none of y'all, but it is truly a new day. 
I was pleased and I said, yes, madam. Happy, happy to be of service. Madam Speaker, I must encourage you and my fellow colleagues here in this place to visit our markets, take your wallets with you, patronize our Bahamian entrepreneurs, wear your Bahamian crafts. Ladies, go purchase your clutch and straw hat set. Huh? Show off your conchial jewelry. Wear your coconut cufflinks like I'm wearing today. <laughs> and today that I purchased at our market. <laughs> Madam Speaker, you must forgive me, but in my position at the Ministry of Works, I spent a lot of time around the minister, and some of what he says rubs off on me. But I have to remind, and I want to remind my colleagues and Bahamians everywhere, that it is this straw market business, this very straw market business, when we look at it, when we look at it juxtaposed to the tourism industry itself, <clears throat> it is the one component of this industry, the one component of this tourism sector that is 100% Bahamian owned. Yes. Yeah. When we look at the players or the parts of our tourism industry, we see the foreign ownership handprint throughout. Consider the hotels, the cruise ship, some of our restaurants. But it is this straw market, this straw market business, this entity that is completely 100% owned. Madam Speaker, we must therefore, we must protect it, we must support it, and we must be proud to do so. Yes. Madam Speaker, I now turn my attention to the supplementary budget and the value added tax bill and the remarks we have heard over the last few days. Let me begin by saying South Beach supports the supplementary budget, and we see it as a responsive relief budget. One where this David, Davis administration is responding to the cries of relief from the Bahamian people. I am no economist, but I have common sense. And generally, what I deduce from my understanding of economics is that any de decrease in prices due to a decrease in taxes in the long run will lead to an increase in consumption and hence an increase in revenues. I have seen the props. We all have seen the props that were brought in indeed to emphasize the point that this bill is placing value-added tax on bread basket items where no value-added tax previously existed. However, I'm inclined to share the argument raised by the Minister of Economic Affairs in this regard to bread basket items that says they represent a small portion of the total grocery bill and that the overall, overall decrease in the larger portion of the grocery bill by 2% would have a greater impact, and the persons tend to consume larger portions of the other goods versus the bread basket items. Particularly as the individual consumer income increases, as it will, the propensity to consume more bread basket items decrease. So, Madam Speaker, when we say we see it as a budget that brings relief. We are speaking to the fact that if implemented across the board, this 2% reduction in VAT will help to eventually lower the overall cost of living in our country. For us, that equals relief. When we say we see it as a budget that brings relief, we are speaking to the fact that if we see the return of the RISE program, and it is instituted properly, where we see social 
assistance given across the board to those most vulnerable. For us, that is equal to relief. We have heard, Madam Speaker, that this budget will bring with it for civil servants an incremental pay, pay increase. If this is indeed the case, and I believe it is, for us, that would equate to relief. We know of the commitment to senior citizens and an increase in pension payouts. For us, this could only equal relief. And of course, the extension of the unemployment program with an additional $500 lump sum payment in December. Certainly, certainly, Madam Speaker, this must equal relief. Essentially, what we are saying is the reduction in the value-added tax across the board by 2% and the direct assistance given to, by the government to the public sector retirees will assist in the increase towards disposable incomes that will normally lead to a higher consumption, which leads to better health, decrease in food assistance, and indeed a decrease in poverty. Madam Speaker, for us, this sounds as relief, relief, and more relief. In closing, Madam Speaker, when constructing a home or a building, and in this case, I dare say, a superstructure, the skillful architect and engineer must ensure that the footing or the foundation is secure. I see and we see this supplementary budget as just that, the first layer of very progressive reforms that are to come. The first layer of very progressive reforms by this administration that are on the way. Madam Speaker, the best is yet to come. Once again, South Beach supports this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Honorable Member. Before we go any further today, um, I'd just like to share with Honorable Members that as it relates to the dis constant disturbances, I am going to be enforcing rule number 32.3. And if that is not adhered to, I will enforce rule 88, section A. Thank you, honorable members. As many, chair, chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me first start off by giving praise and thanks uh, to God for the opportunity to rise once again on behalf of the people of East Grand Bahama. Madam Speaker, it is a privilege to speak in this place on their behalf. God is indeed good. Madam Speaker, I am also a proud member of the Free National Movement. I've served with former leaders, Hubert Ingram, Tommy Turncrest, Dr. Hubert Minnis, and today I stand in full support of our party's new leader, the member for Marco City, the Honorable Michael Pintar. He, 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 he reminds me that uh, both he and the member for, uh, for Central are both cons good constituents of mine. And they, vote, they, they voted for me. <laughs> yes. At least in one election. <laughs> Honorable member, remember to call him member for Marco City. Oh, yes, Ma Ma Madam, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, absolutely, the member for, uh, for Marco City, good member for Marco City. Madam Speaker, I congratulate him 
on his victory. And together, we will unite our party. We will strengthen our party. And we will prepare for victory in 2026. You know, we entered the, the race for leadership. We entered the race for leadership as, and this goes for the member for Marco City and the member for Central Grand Bahama. We entered the race for leadership as political brothers, where our constituencies are literally side by side. And we leave the race for leadership and we remain political brothers. Madam Speaker, to the matter at hand, the supplemental budget. Madam Speaker, unfortunately, the government suffers from a severe case, and this is my opinion. The government suffers from a severe case of selective memory. It cannot be right that everything wrong is the former government's fault. But those things that are positive, this government seems quite pleased to brag about. And in some cases, quite pleased to take the credit for. Many of the government's members spoke to the mismanagement of fiscal affairs. But, Madam Speaker, here are the facts. And they almost spoke to it like it was a script. You know, you could almost anticipate during a, a, a part in their speech when they would uh, speak to it, uh, this mismanagement claim. Madam Speaker, the government's own fiscal snapshot. You know, we introduced a practice in Ministry of Finance. Stop the clock, please. recognize the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy, we introduced, the Free National Movement introduced the fiscal snapshot and the fiscal quarterly reports. Something where every quarter the public can get a snapshot as to what was going on in the country and what, how was the country's fiscal affairs being managed. The last one, Madam, last one, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that was produced by this government. But it spoke to what took place during the last three months of the former government. So it speaks to what took place during the months of July to September. And I just want to quote the first line of the executive summary of this report. It's right on the, on the Ministry of Finance's website. The first, first line. The Bahamas's, and I quote, the Bahamas's improved economic performance during the first quarter of financial year 2021-22 is reflective of the accelerated pace of recovery in the domestic economy. As COVID-19 vaccination and containment efforts improve both domestically and internationally. It confirms that there was an improved economic performance during these last three months. 
in almost every area, the revenue of the country increased. Despite the claim of mismanagement and tough economic times and bad decisions that was made, in almost every area, the revenue of the country increased. And in a budget debate, well, it seems that no one from the government even articulated that revenue will actually increase during the last three months. In a budget debate, the snapshot revealed, and I quote again, the total revenue receipts for the first quarter of the financial year 2021, 2022, increased by 271 million or 90% to 572 million when compared period over period. In other words, the revenue almost doubled during the same period last year. Well, if you were mismanaging the economy, how is it that your revenue almost doubled during the same period last year. This is an estimated 90 million over what was projected. 90 million over what was projected in the budget. I also remind the House that we were criticized about the revenue projections. As I recall, with some saying that we could not justify the revenue numbers. He said, how are you all coming up with those revenue projections? That you all could not meet those revenue projections. And you were smudging the numbers in order to make your budget look good. It turns out, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that not only did we meet the target, but we beat the target by $90 million. And again, it is amazing that during a budget debate, no mention is made that you are actually over your budget when it comes to revenue by $90 million. But see, selective memory, because that was done during the period of the FNM. So we're not going to speak about that. We're not going to talk about the 90 million additional in revenue that is there. The first quarter fiscal report shows we earned more revenue than projected, spent less than projected, decreased the deficit, and borrowed less. The same fiscal snapshot. The same fiscal snapshot said that we earned more revenue than projected, spent less than projected, decreased the deficit, and borrowed less during the same three months prior. The government also, Mr. Deputy, speaks to the University of the Bahamas report. It was mentioned by a number of the government speakers. And this is a wonderful report to read. The University of the Bahamas report was mentioned by the Prime Minister, also was mentioned by a number of the other government ministers. It is a good read. It is actually a very good read. Well, Mr. Deputy, first, this report was commissioned by the Free National Movement. That's the first thing. The project was actually commissioned in April of this year. I remember, I was there. The report states that it actually was looking at the FNM budget and 
the FNM fiscal strategy. That was the basis behind having the University of the Bahamas look at the report. They were looking at our fiscal strategy and they were looking at our budget. And it was the study used economic modeling. So they would put different scenarios into this, you know, whatever formula they use, and, and they would then come up with what they believe would be the best formula. But here is what the report actually says, because you only spoke to a portion of the report that actually spoke to the decrease, what would be the effect of the decrease in VAT. And I'm going to speak to that, what they said about that too. Here is what the study actually says. And I quote, the study found that the Ministry of Finance's current policy, as outlined in its <coughs> December 2020 fiscal strategy report, that's our report, by the way, that's our fiscal strategy report, the FNM's fiscal strategy report. And here's what they say. Can achieve economic and fiscal targets that set the country on a sustainable positive trajectory. So, for everyone who says that the FNM is on the wrong fiscal track, well, that's not what the University of the Bahamas report actually says. It says that our current policy, which was articulated in the fiscal strategy report can achieve economic fiscal targets that set the country on a sustainable positive trajectory. In other words, the FNM is on the right track. But let's see what the UB report says about your new VAT reduction. And you know, sometimes I wish y'all would actually quote the report. Not just say what you think the report says, but just quote it. I want to quote. The report says, and I quote, following a special request by the Ministry of Finance, a simulation exercise was carried out for changing the VAT rate. It found that reducing the VAT rate by 2% from 12 to 10% shows only a slight improvement in the real GDP, unemployment rates, prices, and poverty levels. Remember that. Shows a slight improvement. It goes on to say this. There is, however, a worsening of the current account the fiscal deficit and debt to GDP ratio. There is no change in the GINI ratio. It's amazing. All of these wonderful glowing reports about what is going to happen when you decrease VAT from 12 to 10, but you don't actually say what the report says. The report says there is, however, a worsening of the current account, the fiscal deficit, and the GDP, and the debt to GDP ratio. You know, and I wondered when they spoke about the GINI ratio. Well, that's the ratio that speaks to equal distribution of incomes among individuals and, ho and households. And they said it had no change. So your distribution of, of, of <clears throat> when it comes to funds and income, from individuals and households does not change. But I can be fair. The report also goes on and says this. If the priority is to benefit the economy, even if only slightly, the VAT reduction should be pursued. However, and at the same time, there must be compensating tax revenue initiatives to address the rise in deficit and GDP ratio. So they tell you, if you are going to pursue this track with decreasing the VAT, 
you must at the same time provide the compensating tax revenue initiatives to address the rise in the deficit. <coughs> Mr. Deputy, I do not see, nor was it spoken to. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Grand and Bainstown. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy. I'm not certain if the member for East Grand Bahamas is aware that the Ministry of Finance has also reinstated the Revenue Enhancement Unit. The Revenue Enhancement Unit, before the former administration came to power, was yielding $30 million a month. Since this new administration came to power, that Revenue Enhancement Unit has been reinstated. And I think it's consistent with the report by the University of the Bahamas. Thank you. Madam, oh, Mr. Deputy, unfortunately, we do not see the specific revenue measures that will address the deficit. Mr. Deputy, if we're going to do that, then we also need to project how much is going to be lost as a result of the VAT, into the VAT reduction. And we also must say how specifically it is going to be compensated. What are the new revenue measures to be able to compensate? This report clearly shows that the policies articulated by the free national movement have put the Bahamas on the right track to recovery. The government's own report says it, and we are clearly seeing the evidence of it. Mr. Deputy, also, the Prime Minister and other members referenced an IMF report on Bahamian tax policy. Given his statements, I assume that he is referencing the document, Bahamas Reviewing Tax Policy. And I have a copy of it. Members would recall that during the June 2021 budget debates for the current fiscal year, both the then Prime Minister and myself advised the Bahamian people that the administration at the time recognized that given the fiscal and economic prospects of the country, that further tax reform was required. We stated then, as we believe now, that we needed to expand the tax base and to do so in a way that, we, that would ensure greater equity and fairness in the tax system. I believe it was something that was actually mentioned by the Minister of Works. At some point, we need to have a real conversation on tax reform. It cannot continue to be a political football. We stated that we would commission a tax study and then... The Chair recognized the honorable member for Fort Charlotte. Uh, thank you so very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When I spoke, the Honorable Member would not have been in the chambers. Um, what is the source of that? It, you made a reference to a statement I had made that there need to be... Yes. No, no, no. I'm not at all saying that you said there needed to be a real conversation. I caught the tail end of your contribution, I believe, where you were speaking about uh, tax reform. I'm not... Speaking well, anything you said, I'm actually agreeing with you. So I'm not. I'm not in any. Not not trying to be a controversial. I'm actually. I'm actually saying you and I agree. <laughs> Mr. Deputy, we anticipated publishing the white paper after we would have gotten the report. And the white paper would have been put in the public domain by the end of this calendar year, 2021, so that all stakeholders would be able to contribute to the discussion on the way forward. And we think that's the right way to go. It should not be a back and forward from politicians. It should be where 
there is a, these reports are done by the experts. It is put in the public domain. The public then should have discourse about it. And then we all come together and share how it is the best way to move our tax system forward. The report also spoke to more than just a VAT increase, but other forms of tax reform in particular. And also some matters that we have heard very little from the government on. So for example, I don't believe I heard a mention in this place during this debate on the global minimum corporate tax initiative. It is a live issue and requires us to take a proactive approach. It provides us with an opportunity for real reform and to make our corporate system more equitable. It seems the government is intent, and again, I haven't heard to the contrary in this place, but it does seem that they are intent on burying their head in the sand, which may be to our detriment. <laughs> the chair recognizes the West, um, our old member for West Grand Bahama. I mean, Madam Speaker, you know, the member is. Um, <laughs> sorry, Deputy. Uh, the member is waxing eloquently, speaking of the ministry he once led and all the initiatives he took. It's a wonderful way to pat yourself on the back. Um, I'm just hoping, though, you would tell us about your tax amnesty. Uh, that you didn't collect taxes, that led to the surplus that you talked about, that led to those wonderful numbers. You haven't gotten to that yet. So when you talk about what we haven't gotten to yet, we just became the government. And this is a supplementary budget, sir. And we will be discussing what you have raised in earnest. Absolutely. And we will have not only discussion, we will have a plan. So I'd love for you, as you return to what you're talking about, to talk to us about the tax amnesty. What impact did that have? When people weren't paying the real property tax, weren't paying it when the government wasn't paying any bills. Bills, you know, which creates a surplus, which makes you look good on paper. Why don't you discuss that as well as you discuss all the wonderful things you did, sir? Mr. Deputy, if, you, if, if I was to get an extra half hour, I'd, 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 I'd definitely go and, and speak, to what he, speak to what he says. Uh, but they don't give me an extra half hour. So, Mr. Deputy, let's get to the increase in VAT on breadbasket items and medicine versus the decrease on property transactions for millionaires. It is mind-boggling to me that the government would prefer to decrease VAT for millionaires to purchase property and increase on, bra on bread, basket, items, and medicines. Mr. Mr. Deputy, wouldn't it be better for the poor to keep the VAT off the bread, basket items and keep it off of medication and use the money that you will get from the millionaires to offset this. Even the, and I will refer to it very quickly, but even the articles that there are articles written by, oh, Robert right in articles written by, and I'll, I'll Adopt it if need be, and I'll table it if need be. But the article says, Bria, okay, with VAT increase on 2 million properties. Even the real estate industry was saying that they were okay with this. So they were okay with you in, with this, this FNM government increasing the VAT on millionaires. But we have decided, that despite what they said, we are still going to reduce it, and then we are going to add 10% on bread basket items. Again, if that is your priority, that is your priority. The chair recognizes the honorable member for West Grand Bahama and Dimini. Again, uh, the member is, of course, approaching this subject uh, and, and trying to give the impression that the government has uh, decided to reduce that to assist a particular group of persons of our community. 
that is not the intention. This is a flat rate. This is a zero rate. This is where we have gone to provide across the board for every person in the Bahamas. That is the context, about Mr. Deputy. And that is where I think the member must go, because what he's trying to do is suggest that we were sitting down and we've adopted one of the FNM's policies to take care of the rich. That's not our policy. That's your policy. Mr. Deputy, <laughs> Mr. Deputy, facts are the facts. The free national movement increased back for properties above $2 million. The free national movement decreased or took off VAT of her breadbasket items. You are now reversing. That's all. I move on. My time is going. Members of the government, like again, like it was scripted, all said that this supplemental budget reflects the new priorities of their government. Well, okay, let's look at what, what let's look at what is actually done in this budget, in this book, this supplemental book. You have reduced the net to, or, or you have taken away. $19 million for the Rand Hospital. I recall prior to election, members of the Progressive Liberal Party in the front of the Rand Moore Hospital raising concerns about the hospital. This was after the hospital was recommissioned by the FNM. And we shared some of their concerns. We shared some of your concerns. This is why we put $19 million allocated it in the budget to complete the process to put in place a new four-story tower in Grand Bahama. A contract was signed by the Public Hospital Authority and the Beck Group to design a tower in Grand Bahama and in New Providence. I was there. I was there with the sign, with the signing. It was a wonderful moment for the people of Grand Bahama because the funds were allocated in the budget and a contract was signed for the design of the four-story uh, tower. It was also the consensus that because of the amount of funds already invested in the Rand Hospital, it would be better to complete a new hospital on the existing Rand site. It was therefore important to begin the process for the completion of the Rand in the <laughs> soonest possible time. What will you tell the people of Grand Bahama now? Tell them that you have removed the funding to begin their new hospital without having a clear plan and timeline to replace it. But guess what? There's some people who can get $500 for Christmas. Seriously. <laughs> I hope that they will go. Please stop the time. Yeah, stop time. The, the chair recognizes the honorable member for North Andrews. <laughs> Tall pines. I was coming to I was coming to East Grand Bahama, but you're my friend. <laughs> yeah, you're my friend, so I wouldn't go there. Uh, on a point of order, a uh, point of order. Uh, the minister, I'm sorry, the member of Parliament for East Grand Bahama spoke specifically to a line item in my capital works budget for the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Head 60, item 3111312, construction of hospital tower for the Rand Memorial Hospital was removed. Thank you so much. And the reason why it was removed is not that we have anything against the rest. No, let me finish because you made a statement. You made a statement. Unless there is a... I don't remember. Let, 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 you, let me... There is a point no. of order. Yes, there is a point of order. Let me explain to you why. You said something wrong because you said we remove it intentionally and we have no plan on how yeah. to replace it. I don't remember. It. And I, that's you, my point. I don't remember. Let, let, right let's talk about it. Continue. But you said we have no plan going forward by moving it. And that's what I want to clarify. Because you're absolutely right. It's moved. And the reason why it's moved is because immediately on coming to office, we went to assess where the former government was as it relates to the construction. As it stands today, 
You have minimal architectural drawings. Most of them are preliminary drawings. There is no documented engineering studies. Uh, that too, but I think the other minister will speak to that. And on top of it, we had a technical assessment done and they felt that within four to six months would be the time in order for us to even get the necessary plans together to present them to the Port Authority for approval to go to a tender process and go to bidding in order to award a contract. The fiscal year will be over and the $19 million could not be spent. So what the Ministry of Finance did, sir, the Ministry of Finance put in an additional $5 million in line item 311205, hospital and medical facilities, where the resources were put in place to allow the necessary preliminary works to be completed and the money would be reintroduced in the next budget cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy. Volko. The chair recognize the honorable member for Kalani. This entire argument would be a moot point if the member, if the member had committed and come through it what he had promised when he spoke in 2014, Thursday at the Stemso conference in Grand Bahama at Lucayan Hotel. The member had stated that. A new hospital will be completed, the Ram Memorial Hospital, by early 2017. Uh, the chair recognized the honorable member for Tall Lines. Yes, uh, I did say it. Uh, the facts are what they are. We were sprinting towards the construction of a hospital, and I'm a man, and I can live up to what went wrong. We fell in a ditch as a result. Oh, no, 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 let me finish. No, let me finish. Let me finish because you did utter the statements as well that you're gonna bill it and I will come back to say when you said it and you didn't deliver. So the reality is I am telling the Bahamian people what we intend to do as a government and the Bahamian people will hold us to our word like how they did with you. And at the end of the day, they made a judgment, and that's why you over there and we over here. That's right. And so allow us to do it. We've been in office for eight weeks. Thank you. I appreciate that, or former prime minister. Well, no, no, I wouldn't go there, man, because I wouldn't say that to you. I wouldn't do that to you. No, no, please, please. Yeah, let's be, let's be cordial. Okay, all righty. Uh, I am pleased that you have confirmed that you will continue to proceed with the construction of hospital in Grand Bahama. Mr. De Mr. Deputy, simply put, and I want to speak to the Balco and Equinor uh, transshipment model. Simply put, the transshipment was changed from exempt to zero, and this allowed companies to claim the VAT back. In addition, they, are, were, they were not charging VAT on services that they provide. Uh, those persons who will be familiar with uh, Buckeye and also Equinor, these large transshipments companies in Grand Bahama. This, I'm, I, I'm I am advised, made them more competitive. It is a charge that they will now have to pass on to their customers. So if you now say to them, they must now charge VAT, or these services are now valuable, they must now, must now pass it on to their customers, which they say will make them uncompetitive. Who are the customers? Mr. Deputy, I am asking, they must, they must speak with these companies and have a amicable arrangement for this situation. Here is what these companies are saying. They are saying that to proceed in this manner is going to create, your minister for Grand Bahama said it, not in, not in those words, but she said, she has already spoken to the Ministry of Finance about their concerns. Their concerns are real. They are saying this will make them less competitive 
and it will put the future of their business in jeopardy. We are saying, please listen to them. What we do not want to happen is we do not want companies like Buckeye or Equinor to close. It would be disastrous for Grand Bahama. We do not want to put them in a more in a less competitive position. They have spoken, I believe, already have spoken to the Minister for Grand Bahama, and the Minister for Grand Bahama has indicated she has spoken to the Ministry of Finance. I move on. Have Madam Speaker, Mr. Deputy, again, let's speak to priorities. You've said in the Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Culture, there was a wonderful, eloquent speech about thinking about young people. He spoke to self starter project. Well, in the very same budget, you decrease Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Culture budget by 800,000. Why not repurpose this? Why not take that 800,000 and put it on the self-starter project that was being spoken about so wonderfully? In addition, the $5 million that you take away from small businesses. Why? Why not repurpose that? Why not put those $5 million instead of deducting it, give it in grants to small businesses in Abaco, in Grand Bahama, the family islands, repurpose that money and if you say that's a priority then why deduct it why take it away give it back to the small businesses who need it you've also decreased your minor capital repairs it's right in here look at page 36. unbelievable the house of assembly the senate schools hospitals clinics government buildings all across the bahamas docks all are in need so why decrease it by 1.2 million, all of my family island MPs who spoke again wonderfully about the needs in their communities. You deduct, look under the local government budget, you deduct another $1.2 million for family island capital projects. You deduct it, why? They are crying out in this place and saying what they need. <laughs> the chair recognizes the honorable member for Central and Saudi Lucha. Uh, I, I don't want to stop the member for Sorry, East man. Grand Bahama stream, but in regards to the budget for family islands and local government, there was no specific allocation in regards to the uh, $3 million in that budget. We have overall, and we're looking for ways to assist the family islanders in regards to that. Um, so I'm sure that we have already spoken about increasing the budget for local government. So when the next budget comes around, I'm sure it will be reallocated. Uh, but to, to engage in the next fiscal year, we are looking at ways to do that. So was, there was no plan on where to spend the money. You're, you're the there was, it, was it was just money spent thrown in there. Poor plan. Poor planning. Plan. So we're looking at how we can do it, and we can do exactly. it. Just Thank you. responsible government over here. Stephanie, I wonder if I could just get you an extra minute, please. Yeah, give it to him. He's a good guy. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Deputy, $1.2 million is a lot that could actually be used to benefit all of the needs that they spoke about. $1.2 million. Next. Grand Bahama, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy. The members spoke eloquently about the needs in Grand Bahama. So why? do we reduce the budget in Grand Bahama? You reduce it by almost a million dollars. In fact, the head that you reduce it is special employment projects. You reduce it by $400,000. Why? The chair recognizes the honorable member for Tall Pines. When we look at the Ministry for Grand Bahama budget, and we looked at the $400,000 reduction, we must also look at the 200,000 we put in for other employment. And then I want to refer you to the Ministry of Finance Global Fund. When you were in Grand Bahama, you were the Minister of State for Grand Bahama. We have a Minister of Grand Bahama. And a lot of the responsibilities that fell under the office of the Prime Minister went back, the funding went back to the Ministry of Finance. 
We have not lost any resources in the Ministry of Grand Bahama as it relates to that, that line item. And that responsibility is in the Ministry of Finance, and the Minister for Grand Bahama can access that funding. Um, again, I, I was in the Ministry of Finance. I was also sitting where the Minister sits. It is better for the Minister of Grand Bahama to have access to those fundings to be able to use it as opposed to going through the Ministry of Finance. So as far as this uh, a member is concerned, it would have been better to keep that $400,000 in Grand Bahama to be used for Grand Bahama. I also would like to ask these last questions in this last cup. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Pine Ridge. Point of, point of clarification. Um, with the hundred thousand, with the million dollars that was there in the budget, in that line item, I believe only 300000 was used in the last period by the former Minister of State for Grand Bahama. And so I would think that that gave some justification for the Ministry of Finance to read, yeah, it wasn't used. Um, but I will be accessing that Ministry of Finance line item to receive the funding. Questions are also with the airport. We left in place an arrangement where it was through the uh, the, the uh, Ministry of Tourism and Aviation, where they were going to have put out for to invite persons for tender for the construction and a PPP for the airport. We would like to know what is happening with respect to that. We also would like to know... Uh, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Fort Charlotte. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair. I have a, I have a outline that was given to me by the IDB. I told you I met with the IDB country director uh, yesterday, and what was disclosed is that um, due to a number of factors, the $35 million uh, that the IDB committed for airport uh, development in, in 2017. From 2017, out of the 35 million, only 3%. And what she told me, and, and we're talking on live television, that this is the worst performing loan in the region. So what is happening here, and this is why they, we, we, we are working very closely uh, with the IDB. As you know, there would have been a number of changes uh, to this particular uh, program. Portions of it were taken out and put into a PPP. But, but, Yes, but the point, the, but the, but, 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 yes, but that's part of what is happening now. Um, no, 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 no. We, we, we would have been given, we would have been given a, a presentation to the cabinet by um, the airport authority at the Ministry of Tourism. And the question is being, um, determine whether Freeport Airport should, in fact, be part of this PPP. In other words, there is, first of all, you have these two parallel tracks. There have been a number of changes. There have been extraction from the original design. And questions are being raised and conversations taking place whether the PPP should incorporate uh, the airport in Freeport. Thank you, I'm just reading on the point of order. Um, the, and you're right, there were two tracks, because originally the Grand Bahama Airport was not a part of the IDB uh, airport infrastructure program. The Grand Bahama Airport was specifically dealing with inviting persons, private sector persons, 
to put to partner with the government to move forward with the construction and running of the airport. The I agree. That's why I said Grand Bahama was not a part of the IDB project. Grand Bahama was a part of the family island, other family island projects. And when we left office, the Ministry of Tourism and Aviation had invited private, I was just speaking on the point of order. They had invited private sector persons to put forward tenders. The question I was asking was, and I believe the question that the people in Grand Bahama would like to know, is what has happened with respect to that process? And the chair recognizes the honorable member for West Grand Bahama. The matter being raised by East Grand Bahama would be better answered when the minister responsible for aviation, who today is out of the country, attending a conference reference to airports. So when he returns, he will be given the picture for the Bahamas, inclusive of Grand Bahama. It is, it is then, I mean, it's unfortunate that we don't have the answer. I don't remember. That, but, um, are, are, you, are you wrapping up? I, I'm is... wrapping up, uh, Mr. Deputy. Just two last questions, Mr. Deputy, would be the last question would be with respect to the Ministry of, well, it's no longer Ministry of Disaster, but is now the Office of Prime Minister. But when could Grand Bahamians expect to have the home repair program continue. And the second is, we've heard about the Grand Lucayan, and it is excellent that the minister says that they are close. We also would like to know, and I've been where she's sat, I've said what she said many times, that we are close. And so we would like to know as soon as possible, and I'm sure the people in Grand Bahama would like to know as soon as possible what is the progress with respect to the Grand Lucai. I will take my seat, Mr. Deputy. Thank you for the additional time, um, but I will take my seat uh, very much. Thank you very much. As many. Mr. Deputy, in response to the Honorable Member for ESEN and Grand Bahama, with regards to home repairs in in his constituency. We are doing a review now of the thousands of requests for uh, home reconstruction and aid. The member would know that those aid range anywhere from $2,500 to $10,000. We are presently conducting a, an audit of the DRE, also a forensic audit. And once we are in possession of all the relevant uh, information, I can assure the member from East End that those renovations to those people who have suffered will continue. The chair recognized the honorable member for West, uh, West Grand Deputy. Bahama and Bimini. Uh, just, just, just for uh, uh, future considerations, questions should be given as notices that would allow for the appropriate answers. Uh, we have been gentlemen in this place today and responded to you, but in the future, uh, we prefer you put in the notices so we can have the appropriate answers for you. Yes, you can, but I'm just letting you know in the future be better. Thank you. As many. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Mount Moriah. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, Women across the length and breadth of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas continue to make incredible contributions to the development of our country. Today, women are leading several of our most important industries and institutions, be it in banking, business, law, and politics. It gives me great pride and satisfaction that the member for Angliston, Glennis Hannah Martin, is our acting prime minister. She is the true embodiment of intelligence, grit, dogged determination, and a fight for the downtrodden. She is deserving of all the best, and she makes us all proud. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I also wish to lend my voice to the chorus of well-wishers 
in congratulating the member for Marco City as the new leader of the Free National Movement and wish him well in his new role as the leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. I am sure that the member's family is very proud of him, especially his mother, who happens to be my constituent. <laughs> Lord willing, I wish to secure a vote in the next general election. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I want to say secure a vote again, but I ain't too sure. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I wish the member for Marco City well. Deputy Speaker, I note that many of our colleagues have recognized the important role that the organizations like Zonta plays in the Bahamas. We must do all that we can in this place to support Zonta and similar groups that focus on equality, education, and eradication of gender-based violence. Deputy Speaker, I wish to briefly raise the issue of the decorum in this house. I am in no way suggesting that you need assistance from me in this regard. I am merely sharing my observations. The way we conduct ourselves is important as the contributions that we make in this honorable place. We can debate fiercely and vigorously when necessary, but always respectfully. Let us be mindful that our words and conduct do matter. I believe that the substance of our collective contribution should be the focal point of public interest. We are conducting serious business in this place. The country is listening and the children are watching our actions on social media. Deputy Speaker, I may run the risk of sounding politically naive, naive, as if I do not understand the cut and thrust of politics, but I do understand. However, when the political skirmishes become the highlight of the debate, it sometimes overshadows the substance of the contributions. Deputy Speaker, I am saying this because I truly believe that this parliament, as assembled, has the talent, the experience, and legislative agenda to be transformative. We can do tremendously well for the Bahamian people if we on this side continue to remain focused on the Davis Cooper New Day legislative agenda. And we have. I stand here with a profound sense of gratitude, duty, and responsibility to articulate clearly the hopes, dreams, and desires of the residents of Mount Moriah. The residents of Mount Moriah are intelligent, hardworking, proud, but most importantly, God-fearing. They expect great things from this administration. They have not forgotten our 10-point plan to recover, rebuild, and revolutionize, to provide compassionate social relief and strength and security, to reconstruct, rebuild Abaco and Grand Bahama with resiliency, to foster true Bahamian empowerment, to advance our commitment to the sovereign wealth fund and harness our national resources, to revolutionize education, to initiate our progressive youth agenda, to keep Bahamians healthy by advancing NHI, to lay out a comprehensive plan for each island, and to advance the national development benef to benefit all Bahamians. See, Mr. Speak, Deputy Speaker, we have no time to waste. We must work while it is day. We must be very careful of political distractions and detours that lead us away from our progressive legislative agenda. Deputy Speaker, I hate to point out the obvious, but these are some serious times. The last four years have been very tough. Mount Moriah was not spared. Mount Moriah Small businesses are on life support. Resources are stretched. Bank accounts are depleted. Deputy Speaker, the lows have been very low. The opportunities for positive growth have been very few and far between. Joblessness and underemployment is a major issue in Mount Moriah. And in Mount Moriah, we did not forget the words from the hill to the valley they go on. We will never forget those words. Some people believe that those words foreshadowed what was to come, which this member believed was an all-out assault on employment. 
Many residents of Mount Moriah have found it increasingly difficult to make ends meet. For instance, Millennium Gardens subdivision has seen a number of its residents lose their homes to foreclosure proceedings. We feel this in our tight-knit community. During my campaign, I was able to fend off banks and assist families that needed legal representation. Deputy Speaker, to see these families losing their homes is a reminder that the policies that we make in this place have a real impact on the lives of Bahamian people. And so, Deputy Speaker, I am pleased that we have kept our promise to the Bahamian people to reduce value added tax from 12% to 10%. The reduction of value out of tax provides real positive change, not lip service, but real action, which demonstrates to the Bahamian people that we stuck to our word and that our blueprint for change was not an election gimmick. Every Bahamian will experience the benefits of the reduction of value out of tax. Bahamians will see their dollars stretch further as the reductions in value added tax begins to work its way through the system. As the member for Freetown mentioned yesterday, our safety program, such as the RISE program, will provide additional assistance for those that need it. Over the last four years, working and middle class families have become certified financial MacGyvers piecing together this and that, just to make ends meet. But thank God, Madam Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is a new day. It is not just a slogan, Deputy Speaker. There was truly a sense of hopelessness in the country before the 16th of September, which in this member, member's opinion was the hallmark of the last four years. We are now moving in the right direction. And Bahamians are feeling more hopeful because they know that this administration is a caring administration and understands the expectations of the people. And we clearly understood the assignment. The BLP has always been tasked with bringing relief. And that is what we are doing here today. So said, so done. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have never shied away from the everyday man who have been ignored by those with influence, power, wealth, by inf those who have power and wealth. In these tough economic times, many Bahamians are in search of work and entrepreneurial opportunities. The Public Parks and Public Beaches Authority is the vehicle by which Many everyday Bahamians' hopes and dreams are made reality where they, can, where they can pursue an honest living. The authority was, has created entrepreneurial opportunities for first-time and seasoned entrepreneurs. Deputy Speaker, the authority's approved budget for, the, for this fiscal period is $15.2 million starting from the 1st of July, 2021. I am advised that the two million is allocated for the two million of that 15.2 million is allocated for operational expenses. The other 13.2 million dollars was for contractual obligations. Deputy Speaker, the 15.2 million is the annual budget which allows the authority to pay its bills and meet its obligations. Our obligations, Deputy Speaker, now far exceed the authority's approved budget. While 15.2 million was approved for 2021-2022, the authority's obligation is now approximately $37 million. <laughs> and so when we hear the rhetoric about financial restraint, we see what was happening at the Public Parks and Beaches Authority speaks to something different. Deputy Speaker, the authority has exceeded the annual approved budget by $22 million. To put this into context, that is larger than the budget for the Straw Market Authority, the Development Bank, and BAIC combined. 
Our obligations far exceed the approved funding allocated by Parliament. Our monthly obligation went from 1.2, approximately $1.2 million, to now nearly $3 million on a monthly basis. So what is the timeline on that explosion or injection of ob obligations? The 1st of July, the annual, uh, the monthly projected obligation was $1.3 million. During the same month of July of this year, the authority took on an additional approximately $10.6 million in new obligations. When I say new obligations, I am referring to, to contracts. Sometime between August and September, the authority became aware of an additional $11 million in new contracts. So between the 1st of July and September of this year, the authority's obligations, as I said, increased to $23 million. The authority was issuing contracts beyond what it was capable of paying based on the approved budget. Interesting enough, there were a number of laws that took effect on the 1st of July, specifically the Public Financial Management Act, the Public Debt Management Act, which would have stifled the authority's ability to receive additional funding after the 1st of July. But the authority continued to run the red lights. So what, so what that meant is that even though the authority's debts and obligations were growing, it was unable to raise more money to pay the debts or the obligations that it was incurring. The member for Golden Isles would say that it sounds like at the authority of wartime, but You may continue, Honorable Member. The member for Golden Isles would say it sounds like a wartime budget was being built at public parks and public beaches. $11 million, right on the cusp of a general election. Madam Speaker, the contract, uh, Madam Speaker, the authority's contract writing ability far exceeded its ability to pay. The Prime Minister mentioned on Monday that the authority had spent 60% of its approved budget by September 2021. The authority took on an additional $11 million in contractual obligations. The authority is not only over budget, but was forced to accelerate drawing down on its approved budget. The authority is laden with heavy, heavy obligations. Overspent. Overspent, yes. Overspent. Madam Speaker, contractors are calling the authority every day looking for payments. We have different categories of contractors. Contractors that cannot produce contracts at all, looking to be paid. In this category, contractors state that they have signed the contracts, but they were told to come back to receive their copy, only to be told that there is no contract. Mind you, Madam Speaker, some of these contracts reportedly started working without a contract in hand. They alleged that they were told to start working and that they will be paid later. And so now they are around the office of the authority, Madam Speaker, looking to be paid. Without any evidence, without any proof of a contract, nothing to establish that there, that a contract actually exists, say, actually exists. Madam Speaker, there is another category of contracts that are missing. Former chairmen, there are contracts that exist that does not have the chairman's signature on it or the board secretary signature on it. But these persons have been carrying out work on behalf of the authority. Did they give any money? Or, purportedly. They're being paid. Some of them. And so these are some irregularities, gaps that have happened. And so we are trying to, in our best effort, right-size the authority. Also, Madam Speaker, there are some situations where more than one contractor has 
the same contract, work in the same space. So you have contractor A would clean Boyd Road and he would be paid. Contractor B would come back. Let's say contractor A came in on Monday. Contractor B would come in on Tuesday looking to be paid. For this, the member for Kalani said, "Fast growing glass." Is not correct. I apologize, member Kalani. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. That's right. Our approved monthly obligation should be around 1.2 million. We are spending approximately 2.3 million dollars per month, with a shortfall of about 500 thousand dollars per month, which represents 11 million dollars over the next over this fiscal period. What is clear, Madam Speaker? is that the authority cannot continue to operate this way. It is unfair to the contractors, and it is unfair to the taxpayers. This month, we have a shortfall of approximately $500,000 to $700,000. And we have to find that money, Madam Speaker. I was advised that in these circumstances, where there was a shortfall, the former chairman would pay some of the contractors and then the other, some of the other contractors would just not be paid. And this is what we found as the situation and the predicament that we found ourselves in. What we intend to do, Madam Speaker, is try our best to assist as many of the contractors as possible. We may not be able to, pay, to make full payments, but we intend to pay all of the, contra the contractors for the month of October. But this is the state that we find ourselves in. But I am confident that the new board will right-size the authority. Difficult decisions have to be made. This is a position that we found ourselves in. And the decisions that we make, that I'm sure that I've already spoken to some of the members of the board already, and we are prepared to take whatever steps that are necessary to ensure that the authority moving forward is able to pay its debts and pay its obligations. Madam Speaker, I wish to advise in this house that accountants are currently working overtime at parks and public beaches to figure out where the authority went wrong. There is a lot more that I can say, but the old people say you talk some and you keep some. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I would just say there are some issues regarding capital expenditure and the way that funding was spent. So uh, there's no pump faking. The evidence is there. There is a lot more than I. There's a lot more that I can say. But before doing so, Madam Speaker, I wish to consult the other board members of the authority regarding the financial state of affairs so that they can know exactly what we're facing from a real perspective so they, they can see the dollars and cents. Madam Speaker, I, wanted, I want the public to understand that the authority will take the corrective measures, measures to protect public finances while engaging payment contractors. We know that we're talking about people's livelihoods. And so we don't want to be flippant about that. We want to be very respectful about that. We understand that those contractors are working hard. They are caught up in a tailspin, that a political tailspin that has nothing to do with them. But in order to ensure that going forward that we can pay them, certain things have to be done. We don't want to do it. We want to keep everyone engaged. But it's impossible to have an approved budget from $15.2 million to $37 million, $11 million. 
leading up to August to September, $11 million in new obligations. And the funny thing about that is, the 1st of July, we know by the laws of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, you could not add more money, but you're still out there giving out contracts, knowing that you are pegged at $1.2 million per month. So if you exceed that to $3 million, then you know you win the whole $2 million. So why are you giving the people the contract? So you know you can't pay them, but you say, yeah, I mean, hold on to that anyway. So this is why we say it, 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 it looks like electioneering. It looks like it. You know, it, it walks like it. It sounds like it. And we can see the impact of it where it was not a real financial decision that was being made. It appears to be a political decision. It is scary. And it is Christmas time. Christmas time is looming. And this is why I say in this house that it gives us no joy, no joy to do what we may have to do. But as the member for Central Grand Bahama was speaking to financial prudence and doing the right thing, even when it is difficult to do, we have to do what we have to do. Madam Speaker, before I close, I would like to express my condolences to everyone that we have lost in Mount Moriah. Uh, Madam Speaker, we've lost a strong warrior in Stephen Johnson, a stalwart counselor who was memorialized today at the PLP headquarters. I also want us to remember the life and times of Ernest McKinsey, who was a warrior for the Progressive Liberal Party. Yes. He stood by every member of parliament, from Cole Smith to Arnold Forbes to myself, even when he was sick, he stood with me in GHS. And I remember in 2012 during the election, he put his arms up in the air and said, at polling division number 10, they're gonna have to kill me, but I'm not moving from here. And so these are the kind of warriors we have in our party and we, we must honor them. And we have been honoring them. I would also like to acknowledge the passing of the late Mr. Ira Chris Ferguson, the husband of Karen Kiki Varakas Ferguson. <clears throat> also a very great woman and a worker of uh, an employee of the Public Parks and Beaches Authority as well. My heart goes out to all of you who have lost, lost, one, lo lost loved ones in Mount Moriah. Again, I would like to thank everyone in Mount Moriah for giving me this opportunity to serve my country. I know that it is tough, and Lord willing, we will make it through together. Mount Moriah supports the reduction in value added tax money. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many? Lunch hour. Yes. Uh, it might be fitting for us to break now, return at 3 o'clock this afternoon to continue this debate. Thank I you. now move for suspension. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you, Honorable Member. It is moved and it's been moved and seconded that the business of this House be suspended to 3 p.m. today. As many are in favor, will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The motion is carried. All right. The business of the house is suspended until 3 p.m. today.